Morning, church. It's good to see you. You look great. Hope you feel great. Grab your Bibles. We're in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you in the seat back. That's yours. You can have that. Uh, Acts is about three quarters of the way through the Bible, about that far. Um, if you're planning on coming back next week, mark your spot. We'll be in Acts 18 for a while. Uh, we're in this brand new series called On Mission. I'm excited about it. I know you're not yet because you don't know what I'm going to say, but I do. It's going to be awesome. Four weeks on mission. We're, this week, we're talking about on mission in this city. Next week, on mission wherever you are in your life. Uh, the, the week after that, on mission as a church. And then the final week, on mission in the church. And so um, let's, just, let's just dive right in. Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 1. And after this, and if you want to know what after this was or what just happened, you got to download the podcast from the last three weeks. But after this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. One of the things that hopefully you're picking up on as we study the book of Acts is that Paul didn't really stay anywhere very long. You notice that? He's just on the move, and no matter where he is, he's there on one mission, one purpose, and that's to make disciples, to take the gospel wherever he is. So Paul's mission field is just where he is, wherever he is. And so after this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. Verse 2, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked, for they were tent makers by trade. If you've ever heard of that phrase, being a tent maker before, this is where it comes from. It just means that uh, Paul was bivocational. A lot of church planners, when they start off, you know, they got to have two jobs, deliver pizzas or something to pay the bills while they preach the word. And I'm a little more blessed than Paul because I don't have to deliver pizzas. This is like my full-time gig. But Paul started out by vocational. Later on in his ministry, he has enough support to not do that. Verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Have you noticed that every series starts the same way? Every chapter, every town, everywhere Paul shows up, He's just, he's just laser focused on the mission that God has for him. So every town he shows up to, he, uh, he never gives up. He just goes to the synagogue with the Bible, and he's going to persuade the people at the synagogue that Jesus is the Christ. Now, if you're Paul's business partner, at some point, aren't you leaning in going, hey, Paul, I know how this is going to end, all right? Call me prophetic, but we're going to need a first aid kit by the second week that you do this. Because every single time, it has not ended well. I mean, he gets beat up, battered, bruised, stoned. Remember one time they think he's dead. They rally around and bring him back. He goes back into the city. I mean, he is, he is relentlessly focused on spreading the gospel regardless of the results. He's just obedient to what, to what God does in his life, what God has commanded him to do. That The Apostle Paul is always on mission no matter what. Verse 5. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, remember Paul left, Paul, I mean, uh, Timothy and Silas in Macedonia, so they're working on his behalf there. And so when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus, that Paul was occupied with the word. Underline that little phrase in your Bible, occupied with the word. When I was sitting in the tree stand last Monday studying the word, this little phrase just leapt off the page at me. That Paul was occupied with the word. He hasn't seen his friends in a little while. They've been doing missionary work. They show up to town, and he's going, hold on, I don't have time for you right now because I'm occupied with the word. And, and I, as I was thinking about it, even between services today, that word occupied can mean busy with, but it can also mean like to take up residence in. You know, like if you, if you occupy another country, and, and man, that's what I want. I want God's word to occupy me, to like take up residence in here. And I, I want to ask you the question, what are you occupied with? Paul was occupied with the Word. What are you occupied with? And I know there's three of you in here, like, the Word, but you're weird. But the rest of us, what are, what are we occupied with? Because I'm going to tell you, this is my favorite time of year this next month or so because I'm about to get occupied with some stuff, all right? Uh, uh, football season starts, and I'm just going to be honest, I'm going to be occupied, okay? I mean, the Bulldogs are ranked five, all right? We're ranked fifth out of, in the preseason here, and... Um, and Aaron Murray is obviously in the center of the will of God, did not go to the NFL, but it's going to come back to the Georgia Bulldogs to lead us to a national championship. And, you know, the offense looks great. The defense underplayed last year, so it doesn't matter that we lost all those guys. And I'm just going to tell you that I, I get a little over-occupied on some Saturdays, and then I rewatch the game on Monday, and then Pastor Ryan and I have a few meetings about it because he was an insider with the organization, so i got to kind of get the inside scoop. I get occupied. 
Occupy. And you get occupied too, right? You guys get your blue jerseys and your jean shorts and you think, go ahead. We're good occupied. <laughs> Understand? It's not your fault. You were raised in it. You can't help it. And so I'm about to get occupied. I mean, whew, it's kind of embarrassing how occupied I get with 19-year-old boys playing the game. But I can't help it. It just get occupied. And then, and then the Jags too. I get occupied with the Jags. I'm a Jags fan, man. Go Jags. I got, I got, I know, it's a little rough, but I got faith, hope, and love, people. It's my team. You got to root for the home team. So I'm occupied with the Jags, and, and I've found out really just in the past few weeks that we have some Jaguars that are 11 ers Praise God. So if you're a Jaguar and you're here, come on down to the altar. Let us pray for you, man. We need to get you, get you right, help you out a little bit. We're for you, though. You're amongst family and friends. We love you. And if you ever see me at 1122 service with a Jaguar shirt on, just know the sermon's going to be a little bit shorter because I got to go get occupied, you know, in my seat because I'm going. <clears throat> and then Little League Baseball starts up. Little, we play fall ball at my house. And I know Little League Baseball is not a big deal for you. That's because you're not the returning coach of the defending champions in the Atlantic Beach Rookie Division. But I am, so we got some stuff going on. And, uh, you know, the season looks bright. We got a lot of kids back. And... Um, we just brought Pastor Jeremy Hall in. Um, I don't know if he's a good pastor or not, but he's got an eight-year-old son that I hear is a, a great baseball player, and we needed a first baseman, so we brought him in. Get a little occupied. And then, and then uh, September 14th, deer season opens. Glory to God, deer season. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul wants to shoot one of them son of a guns. All right, that's what, that's the message to remix. But I get occupied with that too, so I've got... You know, I got my camo, I'm dialing my bow in. I mean, I just get really, really occupied with some stuff. And, and, and just by God's grace and where I'm at in my walk with Jesus, I don't get occupied with a lot of overtly sinful stuff, but there's just a lot of stuff in this world that, I mean, if I don't pay very close attention, I can begin to get occupied with all of that kind of stuff. And, and again, nothing in and of itself wrong. Go dogs, go jags, you know, kill a deer. Praise God. But, but... When I graduated seminary, my favorite seminary professor, actually the only guy that I liked at the whole place, one guy, he, he said, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And for you and I to live on mission, for us to be laser focused on what Christ has called us to do, let me just say, I mean, have hobbies, please have hobbies, all right? Go to the Jags game. Take me with you, all right? Let's do that. But we, we better be occupied in the word, testifying that the Christ is Jesus. That's what Paul does. He's just laser focused, occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him, it happened everywhere he went, right? So he's trying to tell them about Jesus, and they oppose and they revile him. And he shook out his garments, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. If you, if you look here, Paul, he didn't let anything get in his way. He was always on mission. Um, you guys remember about 100 years ago when if you, wanted to buy some, if you wanted to get a movie, you actually had to, like, get out of the car and go into a store? It was crazy. Remember that? Remember those days? Listen, teenagers, y'all don't understand. When I grew up, it was rough, okay? You had to go to a store to get a movie. And then you had to wait in this thing called a line. Not online, but just get in one and just wait. <laughs> To buy stuff, not for like a roller coaster, but just like, it was crazy. And so, uh, about ten or twelve years ago, I'm at I'm at Blockbuster, and I go into Blockbuster with one thought in my mind: I hope they have my movie, right? And so I go in, and sure enough, there it is, and I pick it out, and I go get in line, and <clears throat> there's a guy in front of me, and he turns around, and he's all chatty, Kathy. He's like, oh, you know, talking about my movie and stuff, and I know immediately he's a Christian, and he's about to witness to me. All right. Because I can just smell a Christian from like a mile away. They just kind of have a little aroma about them or something and uh, smell like a Bible bookstore. And so, uh, and apparently I must look like a pagan because people witness to me a lot. <laughs> they really do. In airplanes and I mean just a lot. They're like, that guy needs Jesus. We need to talk to him. And so, but when they do, I don't ever let on that I know that I'm in the game. I'm we're on the same team in the same family. I just kind of let them play their game out. You know, it's like an easy practice, you know. And so I'm like, how do you know? How do you, I mean, you know, I just kind of ask some questions and, and kind of play along. And, um, and sure enough, this guy, he, he shared his faith with me. But, but straight up, it's just authentic. It wasn't, wasn't weird. It wasn't rude. It wasn't offensive. Just, he was just authentic. He just started talking to me about the Lord, about where I was in my life. And 
I was plugged into a church or not. And so then I let him in. Hey, you know what? I, I love Jesus like you, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm involved in the church. And he says, well, maybe, uh, maybe you consider coming to my church. And I go, well, actually, I'm really involved at, at, uh, <laughs> at church. I mean, really a lot. And so, but this guy was ready to roll, man. I mean, he was ready to roll. He had come into Blockbuster with a little, like, business card from his church, and it had directions, a little map on the back of where their church was. And he flips it over, and he writes down his name and his wife's name. And he says, if you ever change your mind and, and lead that kind of, you know, God-forsaken church that you go to, and you want to come to my church with me, just here you go. We'll, we'll save you a seat. And I got it and told him thanks and um, had that to my truck. And on the way out to my truck, all I could think about with, was... I mean, when I walk into that place, all I was occupied with is, I hope this place has what I want for me. That's all I was thinking about. Just total consumeristic. But what this guy was thinking, he didn't see it as a movie store. He saw it as a mission field. And he walked into Blockbuster thinking, there probably is a wretched, black-hearted sinner in this place that needs Jesus. There's one. And he, and he <laughs> came after me. See, Paul's occupied with the word. That, that, that's what, I mean, it's taken up residence in him. And so wherever he goes, whatever he does, he's doing the same thing. He's sharing the gospel. So when they oppose and revile him, and he's, and he's going to shake the dust off, verse 7 then, it says, And he left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Now, this, this is big, especially if you're a leader, some, any kind of leader. Um, what, what Paul does is he doesn't let failure stop him. He doesn't let the results of his first try stop him. Paul is crystal clear on God's mission for him. And so he comes up with a plan. My plan is I'm going to take the word into the synagogue. But when that plan falls apart, he doesn't cash out on the mission and the vision that God has given him. He knows that the vision is good, the mission's going to stay the same, but the plans can change like crazy. So what does he do? The, the next Saturday, instead of going into the synagogue, he just goes one door over to Mr. Justice's house. And he's like, listen, I know what God's mission for me is. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8, like it should be for any, all Christians, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Or his mission is what the Great Commission is, that therefore we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that he knows that the mission is the same. But sometimes our plans change just based on our circumstances. And so there are some of you in this room, and God has given you a clear mission or a clear vision for your life, but because the, your plan hasn't worked, do not cash out on God's mission or vision for you. Listen, some, some of you stood in an altar and looked across from one another, and God's vision for you is that you would be you would submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But as you look across the bed in the morning, it ain't turning out exactly the way you thought. All right? The plan's a little, a little rough, but you've got to stay in there, stay committed. Some of you, when you had kids, originally you looked at them, especially remember when they were real little and couldn't really goof up too bad, right? They could only screw up just like a, like a one-foot radius, and now they're screwing up everything. And you're looking at that going, this is not the way I saw it going. But God's vision for you to be godly parents has not changed. You stay on it. Some of you started businesses, some of you started ministries, some of your walks with the Lord, your plans are kind of falling apart. It's not going the way you thought it would go, but that doesn't mean that you cash out on the, on the mission and the vision. Churches do this all the time. Churches do this all the time. They set out to accomplish what God has called them to accomplish, but when they don't get immediate results, they start going, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't the right mission and vision. No, Paul stays laser focused on this vision, this mission that God has given him. But he just changes plans. So instead of going to the synagogue, he goes to this other guy's house. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, and also the inventor of that little drawer in your uh, refrigerator, I think. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many, how many? Many. All right, one more time. How many? many. This is a big deal. Underline that word. And many. Many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. Thank God Paul didn't give up. Thank God Paul, once he was reviled and rebuked by the synagogue, thanks, thank goodness that he didn't give up, but he kept going back. He tweaked, he tweaked his plans a little bit, but he stayed laser-focused on the mission that God had given him. 
Because if he would have given up here, we wouldn't have anything to read in weddings every weekend. Do you know this? Because God saved so many in Corinth, later on, the Apostle Paul writes 1 Corinthians to these people who just got saved right here uh, with Christmas and at Mr. Justice's house. And many Corinthians get saved. And then later, Paul writes a, church, uh, a letter back to the church at Corinth, and he writes 1 Corinthians 13. Every one of you had it read in your wedding. I read it every Saturday of my life now. Love is patient and love is kind. And love keeps no record of wrong. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. You see, sometimes you've just got to, the, the, plans, the plans don't work out the way you thought they were going to work out. Look, it happened to Paul too. I mean, this amazing spirit-filled man of God. And let me just tell you this, your ministry will never match Paul's ministry. Like at our church, when people are sick and need help, they come down front and we pray for them. And we pray, dear God, please heal them. And we believe God for it. Paul would take a handkerchief and just throw it on them, and they would get up and not be sick anymore. Okay, so his ministry is like at a different level. You, you get that, right? That he would blow his nose, and people would get it and rub it on somebody sick, and they would get healed. That's where holy snot comes from, I think. That's where that comes from. And, and so this guy, even some of his plans don't work sometimes. But you know what he would do? He was relentless to not give up on God's mission for him. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul, one night in a vision. Now, if you've got a super high-end Bible, okay? If you've got a high-end Bible, um, the next verse and a half are in red. Now, if you've, got, if you've got one that we give you, then, you know, those are too expensive. So, if yours is all black letters. But I am a professional. So, I have the Cadillac model here with the red letter edition. Actually, Pastor Ryan Stone bought me this Bible, and I'm glad he got the red letters. But you get red letters here in Acts 18. Now, let me tell you why that's a little bit crazy. You don't get a lot of red letters in Acts 18. Why? Because Jesus, the red letters are from Jesus. And he has been crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, appeared to 500 people over 40 days, and ascended to the right hand of God. So there's not a lot of direct quotes anymore. But Jesus thought it so important to remind the Apostle Paul of his vision for his life that he's going he's gonna to come back down from the right hand of God the Father and speak directly in a vision to the Apostle Paul. And that's why you get the red letters. And so it says this. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. So this verse right here is one of um, the most meaningful verses in my whole life, and it forever will be. Let me give you the context of it. <clears throat> we talked about it uh, during the Restore series. But about two years ago, um, there was a, a, a group of leaders from Beach United Methodist Church, of which I was on that leadership team, and we were doing a three-day off-campus meeting to talk about, discuss, try to figure out the future direction of Beach United Methodist Church, particularly in regards to 1122 and our denominational affiliation with the United Methodist denomination. And so we as a team, we gather and we pray and we study and a bunch of us, a group of us, basically laid out for Pastor Jerry Sweat, the senior pastor at Beach United Methodist, four or five options about what we could do going forward. And we all lay out the options. And then essentially we came together and said, but Pastor Jerry, you're the pastor of this church, you're the leader of this church, so you have to decide the direction that we are going. And he went off that night and spent an entire night in prayer. And the next morning, we all gather around the table and sit down and have a little breakfast. And I remember he looked directly across the table once the meeting started and said, I believe, Joby, it is time for you to be the lead pastor of your own church. And I just have a piece about that. I thought, well, that's funny because I have kind of nauseated by the thought of it. <laughs> it's just interesting how the Holy Spirit works through peace in you and kind of nauseated, and, you know, makes me want to puke, all right? And so, and so I, I was really kind of... Oh boy, that's different. And um, and you ever you ever play Bible roulette? You know what Bible roulette is? <clears throat> it's a really terrible way to do Bible study. Okay, but Bible roulette is when you find yourself in that moment and you're like, "Dear God, I need a word from you," and you just kind of flip open and just say, "All right, Lord, what do you want to say to me?" Now, if you're gonna ever do this, let me just encourage you. You, you want to go deep into the Word. Okay. <laughs> you want to get a nice, nice. You gotta get back there. If you, if you go shallow. You know, it could get weird. You might go Leviticus 18, and you're like, 
whoa. Don't read Leviticus 18 during the sermon today, okay? Do not read it. Whatever you do, don't read Leviticus 18. If you're a teenager and you think the Bible's boring, read Leviticus 18. All right, so, so you want to get a deep flow in there. Like if you're going to rule that, whew, all right, get back here in, in the red letters. And so, so that's what I did. I'm just sitting there and I'm kind of, everybody's talking about stuff and what it would look like for a beach to, to plant a church or send me out or whatever. And so um, I had a little, little Bible roulette and I just swing mine open and I looked down and the first passage I see the red letters just caught my attention. And I just looked down, and, and here's what I read. And again, this is seconds after hearing from my pastor that he thinks it's time that I lead a church. And I read, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And it was just God's confirmation for his new vision for me as a pastor. And so that, that verse and a half will forever just be etched into my heart, into just who I am. And look what he starts out with. Do not be afraid. I, I've told you this about a hundred times in the past few weeks. That the most commanded command in all of scripture is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why do you think he has to tell us all those times? Because we're afraid a lot. Can I tell you, one of my least favorite things that Christians say, I'm going to have a whole list of them. Maybe I'll just do a sermon series one week just called Stuff I Hate That Christians Say. But one of the things is when Christians equate their personal emotions with the will of God. Like, I don't know if I should do that just because I don't have a peace about it. What? See, I, I know that, that God is, is more concerned about his kingdom than your comfort. And my own experience is when I do have a peace about something, it's typically my own idea. It's usually when I'm scared and trembling and feel like I'm going to throw up. That's usually when the Lord is working. When the Lord comes in and says, all right, you're going to launch a church, huh? I don't think I can do that. I know you can't, but I'm going I'm to cover the gaps, okay? Or when the Lord calls us to, to a new mission, a new ministry, that kind of thing. Or even personally, when the Lord calls me personally to just share my faith with somebody, now, let's be honest. I shouldn't be afraid. I'm a professional. I get paid to do this. I ought to be able to just walk up on somebody in Walmart and just share the gospel with them. But I don't feel a peace. I kind of feel awkward. Just kind of feel like, hey, uh, I'm not really sure how to do this. Uh, if you've got your Bible, would you turn to, I mean, you know. So in, in the Bible, in the King James Version, if you put together all the don't be afraid, fear not, do not worry, be strong and courageous, if you put all those kind of fear verses all together in the King James Version, 365 times we are commanded in the Bible, do not be afraid. Now that, that ought to make something happen in you. But there's one for every day. I guess, I guess one day every four years, you can freak out. But the rest of the days, <laughs> do not be afraid. You see, because fear paralyzes and again, we've talked about this before. The opposite of fear isn't courage. The opposite of fear is faith. It's faith. And fear paralyzes, but faith compels us to action. And so he says, do not be afraid. And then he says, but go on speaking and do not be silent. In other words, you just keep preaching. That's what I heard from the Lord. You just keep preaching that the mission will stay the same. You just continue to deliver the gospel, to deliver the gospel, to deliver the gospel. That's it. We're not going to do five-point sermons on how to be a better version of you. We're just going to preach the gospel. Keep preaching and do not be silent. That the mission is the same. We're going to make disciples. The plans are going to change like crazy. We're going to change churches. We're going to go from denominational to non-denominational. You're going to change uh, uh, roles. You're going to be one of the pastors. Now you're going to be the lead pastor. You're going to change locations. You're going to change um, ecclesiological structure. You're going to change all kind of details of the plan but the vision is the same. Go on speaking and do not be silent. Why? Verse, verse 10, for I am with you. You see, God wants the apostle Paul to know, this ain't about you. This is about me. If it's up to you, Paul, you should be afraid. But because I am with you, you don't have to be afraid. About half the times of the 365, when, um, when, when God tells us in the scripture to not be afraid, he usually tells us why. About half the times, he says, for I am with you. 
not do not be afraid because you're awesome or don't be afraid because you can handle this or don't be afraid because I will never give you more than you can handle. That's not in the Bible. Don't be afraid because I am with you. When I used to go fishing with my daddy, I didn't worry about anything. Why? Because my daddy was driving the truck. My daddy was driving the boat. My daddy was tying the hooks on and teaching me how to do it. I knew he had the details under control. Why? Because he's my daddy and he's got it under control. And the same thing's true now. When I know that the Spirit of God comes on me and, I, and, and God is leading us to do some things, like start new services, expand a building, and we've only been here 10 months, when he starts to do that, there's some things that creep up in there and go, uh-oh, why would anybody do that? You know, it just makes it harder on the staff. Yeah, but, but our Father's with us. We don't have to be afraid. And so that's what he says. He says, don't be afraid. Go on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. Now, see, I didn't think somebody was going to try to kill me, but, you know, there were some verbal attacks, but that's fine. But, but essentially what he's telling Paul and what God wants us to know is that the church will not fail. Now, we might hit some failures. We might stumble and fall sometimes, but the church will prevail. You know how I know that? This past week, we spent a lot of time on the organizational chart here at the Church of 1122. Now, I know some of you might even find it shocking that we have an org chart. Some of you thought, I thought you just sat around and prayed. And yeah, right. Now, we actually have to pay bills and run a whole thing here, all right? And so we're working on org chart and reorganizing people and all of that. And so at the top of the org chart, it says, lead pastor, there's my name, right beside me is a board of elders. And then from me, straight up, there's one box, senior pastor, Jesus. Now, this isn't trying to be cute, but the Bible says, Jesus said he was the chief shepherd. In Greek, shepherd and pastor are the same word. So he's the chief pastor or the senior pastor of our church and so as the lead pastor of this church i'll do a few things i will make disciples i'll love my wife and i'll raise my kids and jesus said that he would build his church that's what he said in caesarea philippi to his disciples he said upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it that jesus himself will build the church and that it will prevail there will be local churches that don't, but the church will prevail. So we don't have to be afraid because we know that, that the church is going to prevail. And then he goes on to say, for I have many in this city, in this city, who are my people. Underline those three words, in this city. You see, it's been our prayer, my and Gretchen's prayer, that we could make disciples in Jacksonville all the days of our lives. Until the Lord either comes back to get us or brings us to him that we can make disciples in this city. And I've just got to let you know, uh, two years ago when this whole, all this stuff was happening, we were talking about planting this church. The easiest thing for us was not to plant a church, but it would just be to apply to another church. Because uh, I know you don't think about this as a career, but you know, it's what I do for a living. Uh, my resume at that point was pretty okay. Like, if you start a service at a, non, I mean at, a, at a Methodist church and it grows to 1,500, you can kind of go preach some places. The easy thing would have been to go find a church that was already established, had all their systems working and fully staffed and a building and all of that, and just kind of plug into what they were doing. The easy thing is not to go find an old decrepit Walmart that looks like the end of a Terminator 2 movie and go, hey, let's make this a church. <laughs> but you know what the problem was? The king. You see, I don't set the plans and say, hey, come bless my plans. All right, I'm just a soldier in the king's army and just do what he commands me to do. And by his grace, he was commanding us to, to don't be afraid, but go on speaking and don't be silent. And part of it was because he had many in this city who are my people. And so, it, it, can, we just, can we just take just a second and just celebrate and just kind of marvel in all that God has been doing in us and through us and among us. There's a verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 um, <clears throat> where, where the apostle Paul, um, he, he talks about his, his crown of accomplishment. It's basically like he's talking to the church at Thessalonica and he's like, can I brag for a second? But I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on what the Lord has been doing. But I see you as like a, a, a crown of accomplishment. You know what's happened since I read that verse a few years ago when our team got together and prayed and heard from the Lord that we needed a, a, a church here, we're going to start the church of 1122. Can I tell you, one of the things is we planted a church, folks. God did it, but you and I together, us, we planted our church. And let's just be clear about this. This is our church, okay? It's not my church. Don't come up to me in public and say, I go to your church. Because I go to your church too, so that means it's our church, all right? We're all here together. 
But we planted a church. Think about this. Ten years ago, right now, on a Sunday morning or afternoon, there was some lady standing right here in ladies' accessories trying to decide between two tacky Walmart necklaces. Hmm. One of these is going to complete my life. That's what she was doing right in this place. And her husband was over there in Lawn and Garden trying to just waste time because he felt awkward being here in the lady accessories department. And that's what used to happen 10 years ago in this place. And now God has captured it and reformed it and changed it into holy ground. And in this same place, people surrendered their lives to the Lordship of Christ. Amen? I mean, so we planted a church. <clears throat> and since, since we opened the doors in uh, uh, September 23rd, check this out. That 679 people have surrendered their life to the Lordship of Christ for the very first time. 679. We've had 312 baptisms. That is crazy. In less than a year. This past year, we started 60 disciple groups, and we have 50 more in the wings being ready to, to, to go forward. We, as a church, folks, we sponsor 2,400 Compassion Kids. You don't understand how big of a deal that is. <laughs> that you, us, our church, that we sponsor more kids per capita than any other church in the history of Compassion International. Now, you think it's neat, but let me go to a pastor's conference and bump into some of those famous pastors. I'm like, yeah, we do a little work with Compassion, too. <laughs> We're the best. That's what we are. I'm trying to get compassion to do like a belt, but I don't know if they'll. This year we sent out 14 mission trips with over 350 missionaries. And 50 of them last week were our kids here serving locally. On Wednesday morning of this last week, the Martins gather up and hold hands, and we do a prayer commissioning service to commission our, our little missionary, JP, on his very first mission trip. Isn't that awesome? And when he came home with his mission trip t-shirt, he's like, Dad, I got a shirt just like you. See, because if you're the lead pastor, you can get the shirt from all the trips, all right? Right? If you own AT&T, you can get whatever phone you get. I get free t-shirts, and so I got them all. I left the orange one in Brazil, but all the rest of them, I have the colors. And so he felt so awesome that he, that he had a mission trip T-shirt. I mean, those are our kids. Um, it, it's just, I mean, isn't it ama- it's just amazing what the Lord has been doing. In fact, uh, if you take our average weekend attendance um, and just kind of compare it to other attendants around the country, our church is in the 0.04% of the largest churches in America. You get that? So there's, it's crazy, crazy, crazy. Now, let me tell you one that just blew me away two weeks ago. We're in Brazil, in Cadu, and we go up on this hill, and there's a church that we planted. You and I, together, our family, our church family, we planted a church in Brazil. They got three buildings. They got a church building, a building where they, they all feed them, feed the kids, got a kitchen and a place to eat, and then a school building. And we, our church, planted that church. Now, the thing that it did really register until we got up on the hill and saw it two weeks ago, that last year when our team went to Brazil to check it out to see about planting a church, we hadn't planted our church yet. So this year we planted two, the one we go to and the one our, our friends in Brazil go to. Now, now think about how crazy this is. Um, you know we're 10 months old, right? I know we forget that. When we show up every week and we're like, hey, how come this church doesn't have everything that, you know, my church I came from that was 40 years old has? Well, we're 10 months old, people, all right? Imagine, let me just put it in perspective. Imagine, moms, that your 10-month-old came walking into your room one day. Hey, mom, what's up? Come here, we need to talk. And you're like, you're huge. I know I grow fast. It's kind of weird, isn't it? All fat and just awkward but huge. Come here, mom. Come here. Come on, I got places to go. Come here. I gotta, we got to chat. I'm just groan and talking to you. Yeah, uh, I... I I just want to congratulate you because uh, you're a grandma. I had one. Look, there's another one. Okay? I know babies shouldn't have babies, but it's okay now. All right? That's what we're doing as a church, a little baby, big baby church. And there's a church that's planted from here already. I'm telling you, it's the craziest thing in the world. Or the fact that, that about 4,000 people would call this church their home church now. It's crazy. I mean, if we're in the 0.04% of largest churches in America, imagine if you're 10-month-old was in 0.04% of the largest people in the country. You'd be on TV. You'd be like, he's huge. Look at him. And so praise God. Now listen, we count numbers, but but you're not a number. 
The, every one of those numbers, that 679 number, represents you, people, individuals. That's the only reason we keep up with those kind of numbers. We don't have any kind of numbers goals for attendance or any of that kind of stuff. The only, the only numbers goal I pray for is I pray for at least 365 salvations every year. Because in the book of Acts, it says that, that they were, uh, many were added to their number daily. So I figure if we do one a day, that's 365. Every four years, I, I go for 366. That's what I pray for, okay? And that represents people. It represents you. And I want there to be more. Not just more so we can have a bigger church, but I want more people to know Jesus. I want more sins to be forgiven. I want more people to walk out in the water and profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want more of you connected in disciple groups. I want more of us going on mission trips all over the world, not just because the world needs us, but so God can just wreck and ruin our lives on those kinds of trips. More individual people in the family. Like when, when, when people ask me about my family, I don't say, when they say, how's your family doing? Four. No. No, I talk about the individuals in it. And so you are, if you're here today, you matter to God, therefore you matter to us. And God has been doing some amazing stuff here, amazing stuff here. But we always want to be careful. We want to celebrate it like crazy, but we want to make sure that you know that we give God and God alone the glory. That's why he says to Paul, that's why he says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Um, JP in his room, he's got like one of the coolest beds in the history of beds. Um, it's a fire truck bed. There it is. Isn't that cool? Now, here's what's all, even more awesome. My dad built that. My dad. My dad, he's all, my dad's awesome. My dad, um, he can kind of build everything. Or you can take this picture here. Uh, he, he can kind of build everything and just fix everything. Anybody got a dad like that? Just build everything, fix everything? Nobody, you poor people, that's your problem. You didn't have good dads. All right, well, my dad was awesome. Built everything, fixed anything. That's what he could do. And, and I thought when I became a dad, it would just like, you know, fall down from heaven on me, but not so much. Uh, but I know more Bible verses than him, so it works out. So, <clears throat> so, so my granddad, Joseph Perry Martin Sr., and my dad, Joseph Perry Martin Jr., were looking in a, a Sears catalog a few years ago. 30, 40 years ago, all right? Sears catalogs, kids. It's like Google in a book, okay? It's like all kind of stuff, and it's just like red. And so uh, they're looking through, and they see this bed, but it was too expensive, so they said, all right, we'll just build it. And so Joseph Perry Martin Sr. and Joseph Perry Martin Jr. get together and build just from scratch. I mean, it's just plywood and paint and bolts and two-by-fours, and they put that thing together, and they built a fire truck bed for me to sleep in, Joseph Perry Martin III. And so I... Man, I mean, when, can you imagine when you're like three years old, or how, I think I was about three years old, when that became my bed, and I'd sit in there and play fireman, and the, the little top, that's the, that's the top bunk, so we put a bunk up there, and, and then the, the engine compartment is a toy box, so you put all your toys in there, and that ladder actually works, you can climb up the ladder in the back and get on the top, I mean, this thing was amazing. And so I slept in there and, and uh, you know, had a little brother too. So we had like WWF and elbow drops from the top. And I mean, there's some amazing kind of memories there. And I slept in there from three till, I don't know how, 19? I, no, probably not. <laughs> you know, stayed in there for a long time. And then when I kind of graduated to a regular bed, my younger brother, he, he slept in the fire truck bed. And then when he outgrew it, we disassembled it and we put it in my grandmother's garage for the last 25 years, maybe longer. And then when Joseph Perry Martin IV, my son's ready to, to go from crib to big boy bed, then we go to my grandma's house and we, we pull out the fire truck bed and we put it in his room and reassemble it and put that whole thing back together. And if you come to my house, one of the things that I want to show you is my fire truck bed, the one that I slept in that my dad made and now his grandson spends the night in. You think that's a big deal? I think it's a big deal. And so when I pull people in that room and go, check it out, my daddy made this for me 30, 40 years ago and now my son sleeps in it. You know what no one's ever said when they see the fire truck bed? Nobody ever looks at that and goes, wow, those must be craftsman tools. That, it's, it, that must be craftsman tools. Could I see the skill saw that cut that? Could I, I want to have some words with the hammer. Bring me the hammer. That must be an amazing hammer. What sort of screwdriver would one use to get that to come out? Nobody does. Nobody ever gives credit to the tools. They only give credit to the one that made it. And so I hope you know this, church, that you and I are just instruments in the hand of an almighty and loving God. 
And so praise God we have a talented staff. I mean, good gracious, we've got the greatest worship pastor in the world. Praise God. We've got the most talented staff ever. I mean, thank you, Jesus. We've got an amazing group of men that are the elder board here at the Church of 1122. We've got awesome deacons. We've got a thousand of you in serve staff. And praise God that you're awesome, that God's wrecked your life in such a way that, that you can't stop talking about what you've seen and heard. So you tell your neighbors and your friends, hey, you got to come to church with me. It's awesome. You can come just as you are. All right, the service is kind of late. Don't have to dress up. And that guy even loves you enough. He'll tell you you're a wretched, black-hearted sinner on your way to hell. So surrender your life to Jesus. All right, and we do that, and everybody gets saved. Thank you for all that, but it's not about us. We are just instruments in the hand of an almighty and loving God. And so he gets all the glory for anything great that happens here at the Church of 1122. And you know what I think? I think it's just getting started. I think it's just getting started. Because um, I don't think God would do all this in 10 months just for it to end here. I believe he's just getting started, that there will be more and more people that come to know him. And I think... I think he's just getting started even with, our, even with our building here. I mean, I think this building's awesome, all right? And we are not trying to build Six Flags over Jesus. I mean, you can tell by the way we built this place, right? We want to be very functional. We, we want to be very efficient so that we can take that money and spend it in missions and, and sponsor more children and all that kind of thing. But God is doing an amazing work here, and I think he's just getting started. I mean, imagine the day when you pull, when you pull off of Beach or off of San Pablo and this entire corner of this lot is all Church of 1122. That there are things like Community Transformation Center right here. That when people come and need a job, they don't just fill out a needs card, but they could fill out an application because we could put some people to work. Imagine if we had enough room for all the kids of all the friends that you want to bring and we didn't have to turn people away. And, and I'm just going to tell you, you know, we're starting a brand new service tonight at 522. And when you have to add services in August, then, then it won't be long before we're going to have to expand even our worship center. And I believe God is going to call us to plant campuses around our city. Some of you crazy people, you drive like 45 minutes from here, all right, to come to church. And you're, you're willing to do it, okay, because you love Jesus. But your pagan neighbors won't go that far. So what if we could take the church of 1122, this experience, and we could come toward you? That we could go north. We could go south. We could go west. I think east is covered, right? There's just fish, and that's all. But we can begin to come to you. Why? Not because we think we're awesome, but because I believe God is just, he's just getting started. That this thing is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so imagine the day. And let me tell you where it starts. It starts with the Restore Project that we just started this summer. We have to get that thing finished before January. You know why? You remember what happened last January? Everybody woke up with a New Year's resolution, and it was Church of 1122. We just... Grew by a thousand. Just one week, we're at this number, and a thousand more people came. And then we were all, because we're such great leaders, we were like, oh, they'll, you know, it's just like the gym. It'll just be crowded for a while, and then it'll go back. It didn't go back. You're all still here. Praise God. Welcome to the family. Now, if we're going to be ready to do that again this next January, then we've got to get the Restore Project built out, which means we've got to really throttle down on it. Um, if you'll remember, during the Restore campaign, I stood up and said, we need to raise the money in six months. Well, we didn't. So we've got to change a plan. Remember, the vision's good, the mission's the same, the, the plan's changed. So we're extending that from a six-month campaign to an 18-month campaign. So if you, if you went home and prayed, dear God, what can I give in six months, and he gave you a number, then you need to go back to him and be like, hey, the pastor said 18 now. So you and Jesus hang out and come back with a new number that represents 18 months, a year and a half. And what that will do, if you were a part of the Upon This Rock campaign, that'll put the finish line the same, that'll put the finish line at the same as the Upon This Rock campaign. So everybody will all have the same finish line. Um, also, if you'll remember, I said, uh, if you gave to the Upon This Rock campaign, just pass on the Restore Project. And that was, wasn't that kind? Aren't I a loving pastor? I, I feel like some people should just say, thank you, pastor. That was so loving of you. Well, it was loving, but it didn't work. So now... Uh, upon this right, people, turns out you're the uh, best and most mature givers, and so you are welcome and encouraged to get in the game. Now, here's a question that we get asked sometimes. We get asked, now, why are we investing millions of dollars into a place that we rent? Because, you know, we lease this space. And I understand, if I came by your apartment and you were putting hardwood floors in your apartment, I'd go, hey, time out. That's a bad investment, all right? You know, like you don't run high octane in your rental car. Everybody, I hope not, all right? Well, if I tell you a secret, just don't tell anybody, okay? It's just us. 
we ain't going to rent forever. You understand? That, that, that in the very near future, we hope to own the ground that we're walking around on. Okay? Amen? So we're investing in this place because this is home base until Jesus comes back. And so we've got to continue, continue, continue to invest in this place. And so <clears throat> the reason... The reason that that's so important and we've got to get that knocked out is because we don't want to be the limiting factor in the mission and the vision that God has given us. Just like when Paul went to the synagogue and he didn't work, he was like, okay, but the gospel's the same, so I'm going next door. So that's what we're doing. Sometimes the plans don't go exactly the way we thought, but the vision is the same. That this is a movement for all people, all kind of people, all color people, you kind of people, everybody, to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so... Well, here's what Jesus wants Paul to know. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. In verse 11, and he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Um, in, in Paul years, a year and six months is a long time. Notice he doesn't stay anywhere very long at all, but in Corinth he stays for for a year and a half. Can I just tell you the plans that, that, that we have, my family has, is that we want to stay here until, until we're done. So we believe God has called us to this city to make disciples in this city for the rest of the days of our life. And then when we're done, we are done. Praise God. We'll be in his glory, and he won't need me to do this anymore. Well, he doesn't need me to now. He could do it without me. But I won't even have the opportunity to preach in heaven. You guys know that, right? Everybody realize that when I'm done here that my job's over. Jesus is never going to lean in and be like, hey, uh, would you mind preaching a sermon here in heaven? Well, I sure wouldn't mind. All right, let's open to Titus. I, Paul, there's Paul, uh, say to you, Titus, hey, Titus, no, we're not going to do that. But in the meantime, from here to there, then we are going to be about the mission that God has called us to be about. And here's what we need from you. And, and I'll just tell you, I do things a little bit different than the way I was taught. I was taught as the lead pastor, especially of a big and growing church, that my job is to cast a compelling vision and then get you on board with my vision. I think as the lead pastor or the, the lead shepherd here under the senior pastor of Jesus, that my job is to create the kind of environment where God unleashes his vision for your life in your life. And then we all band together as a family on that common mission and common vision. This isn't about, come on, I've got a plan. I need you to help accomplish my plan. I think it's, I think it's to you encounter the almighty living God in this place, and then the vision that he gives to you begins to well up in here, and I help cultivate that. And then he just lines us all up heading in the same direction. And so here's what, here's what we need. In order, for, in order for the church to fulfill its mission, it must be filled with people living missionally. In order for our church to fulfill its mission, it's got to be full of people that are living on mission. So what's God's mission for your life? In your notes, if you'll open it up, you'll see that I said, uh, here's how God changes the world through the church of 1122. And, and as I was studying this passage, if, if you'll just look, there's seven things within this passage that just kind of leapt off at me. I'm going to spend like 30 seconds maybe on each one. Here's how God's going to change the world through the church of 1122. The first thing is through personal relationships, not mass marketing. Look at verse 2. The Apostle Paul had personal relationships with people in that city, and that's how God used it to expand the gospel. Like, we do not have a mass marketing campaign. You're not going to get flyers from us. You're not going to be driving down 95 and see an invitation in, from a glamour photo of me and Gretchen saying, please come to our church. You know, you're not going to see that. If you're here today, it's because somebody loves you and invited you to be here, period. And if that's weird for you because it was your golf buddy, I understand. I hope he didn't invite you that way. Hey, Ted, I love you. You want to come to church? Uh, I don't think so. But that's what happened. It's just us talking with us about what the Lord is doing. That's what they did here. Secondly, is that we will be occupied with the word. Look at verses 5 and 11. You see what he does? It starts by being occupied with the word, and then the whole year and a half he was there, he taught the word of God. That's what we're going to do. We're going to teach the word of God over and over and over and over and over. Because of our explosive growth, we've had, we get churches that call us all the time and say, what is the secret to the growth? And I go, okay, are you ready for this? It's cutting edge. Get out your pen and paper, and you're going to want to write this down. Okay, verse by verse, book of Acts, two years. Thank you very much. All right, that's it. That's all we do every week. We just roll out the word of God and just watch God do what God 
does, that we will be occupied with the word. The third thing is that we will continually point people to Jesus. Look at verse 5. He just points people to Jesus. That's why we don't preach a lot of sermons about you becoming a better version of you. But we just talk about the cross, talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've got a marriage problem, you really got a gospel problem. Because either wife, you don't know how to submit to your husband as unto the Lord, or husband, you don't know how to love your wife as Christ loved the church. You don't know how to mutually submit. It's a gospel problem. If you're in debt up your eyeballs, I don't need to do a series on here's 10 ways to get out of debt. You need to surrender to Jesus at the cross and understand how God runs the universe. And you've been called to run your household income the same way he runs the universe. Okay? It's a gospel problem. And as we draw near to Jesus, those peripheral kind of um, things that you're going through, it's amazing what the gospel will do to redeem and refine those things in your life. And so we don't do a lot of uh, here's how to enjoy your best life now kind of sermons. We just point people to Jesus, 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 Jesus. The fourth thing is through ministry partnerships in this city. That's what verse 5 teaches us, that Paul would partner with people in that city to reach that city. One of, the, one of the mistakes that churches like ours can make is overestimate the awesomeness of your own church. Because, yeah, there might be 4,000 people here this weekend, but, you know, our city has a million people in it. I'm pretty sure our church ain't going to go to a million. Where will we park, right? I mean, so it means that we've got to partner with other ministries and organizations all over the city and all over the world to accomplish God's mission for us for his glory. One of the things I'm so excited about is in September, right around our one-year anniversary, um, from September the 18th through the 22nd, we are going to have a revival here from Wednesday night to Sunday. And what we're doing is inviting some pastors that have been around more than one year like we have to come in and kind of lead us in this. Uh, um, Bishop Van Gaten, Bishop George Davis, uh, Pastor Stovall Weems, Pastor Jerry Sweat, and myself will all preach, not at the same time, on different nights and we've got worship bands coming in. And what we want to do is partner with other churches that don't do things the way we do it necessarily, but they love Jesus and, and are under the authority of the Word of God. And just come together as a city and just lift up Jesus' name. So get used to more and more of that. And folks, you need to start praying about that too. We are 21 days before that revival starts. We're going to call our church to church-wide fasting. We're going to do a Daniel fast together, okay? And listen, I, I told you before, I grew up Southern Baptist, so we didn't fast from anything but Budweiser and rated our movies, all right? So it's even kind of new for the pastor, too. But we are, we're going to fast and just seek the, the, the face of God together with other ministry partners in this city. The fifth thing, we will fail forward. We understand that the vision is solid, but plans change all the time. Look at verse 6. That's what it teaches us. And so if, if you want to come to a safe church, this is not your church. This is not your church. That we're going to try some stuff, knowing that sometimes God lets you fail for your own faith. You ever notice that? You ever notice how sometimes it's in your failure that you come running to him? Maybe that's why he doesn't let you succeed at everything. There's so many times where I start to walk through the mud, and I'm like, Lord, I need help. He goes, I got you, and just drags me in there deeper. All right? How was that for help? That's how we're going to do this church, too. We will fail forward. The sixth thing is that we will be a church of courage. 365 times, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Because fear paralyzes. Fear paralyzes. So we are going to step out in faith. Why? Because he's with us. Not because we think we've got it figured out, but because he is with us. And then this last one is huge. We will listen to the Lord. That's what verse 9 says. We will listen to the Lord. I can promise you this. As your pastor, I carve out an inordinate amount of time every week. Like tomorrow... For literally hours upon hours upon hours. It'll be me, Jesus, my Bible, my compound bow, and maybe a dead animal. But we'll all be there together. But what I really do, part of the reason I go out in the woods is there's just, what else are you going to do? It's just me, a tree, and Jesus. And I go, okay, Lord, you've, you've appointed and anointed me for this season to be your under-shepherd for this unbelievable movement that you're leading. So I'm listening. What's next? What do we need to do in this arena? What do we need to do in that arena? I pray for you specifically if you fill out a prayer card. And then pray for direction for our church. Leadership is as easy as listening to God and doing what he says. Now you don't just need me to do that in the woods. I need you to also do it for your individual lives. Because in order for our church to accomplish its mission, we collectively, individually need to be full of people, individuals that are living on mission. And then we just gather every, every weekend like a family reunion right here to lift up his name and to be fed and then to scatter and go out and continue to be on mission. 
You know, probably the most important part of our time together on the weekend is what happens in the next five minutes. I mean, we sing praises to Jesus. That's awesome. Praise God. And then, and then I preach a sermon, and I hope it just kind of stirs you up, and the Holy Spirit just works you over. But it's this little marination time that happens in the last five minutes of the service that could be the most important. It's why we make a big deal about coming down to the altars, because you need to clean out your ears and cleanse out your heart and listen to what God's mission for you is. Because some of you, the plans have all gone crazy, and you need to hear, you need to hear his vision for your life again. And I know he could speak to you right where you are in your seat. I know. But there's just something about stepping out and coming down here and kneeling, literally kneeling before your king. And saying, okay, king, okay, Lord, here I am, send me. That I want to hear from you and then do what you call me to do. Some of you need to hear it for the first time. Some of you need to be reminded of the mission that the king has put you on. And we want to be the kind of church that cultivates God's vision for your life. In order for us to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish as a church, it's going to require all of us, all of us living on mission. Would you please stand and pray with me? Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord. Um, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. God, that you are near. That you are near. God, I thank you and I praise you that you speak to your people. God, you speak through your word. You speak through your through your prophets, God, you speak to our hearts. You speak through songs. But, God, you speak to your people. And so, Lord, I pray for, for your voice to be loud and clear to the individuals in this place and then also collectively as a church, Lord, that we would listen to the voice of our King and then we would be obedient to do what you call us to do. God, may we not be afraid. May we just keep on preaching and teaching. God, because you are with us. And may we know that nobody's going to harm us. We don't have to be afraid because nobody's going to harm us. Because you have many people in this city who are your people. So God, here we are. Send us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, every week we end the same way. We respond to the gospel. You respond by bringing your tithes and offerings to the giving boxes around. We respond by joining our voices together and singing. But today, especially, I want to point out what it means to come down to the altar. Now, if it's anything like the other services, if the altars are full, then you just stack up three or four or five deep. But you just come down and bend your knee before your king and listen for God's mission and vision in your life, I hope.